Hello students, today uh, we will see about the fullness and what is fullness, why it is introduced and what are the reasons for introducing this one and also the types of uh, introducing the fullness. Fullness of material is an important feature of the style as well as necessity for ease of movement in a well fitted garment. Fashion changes the basic methods of controlling fullness that frequently recur though adopted to enhance the current style. Fullness is introduced into garments for various reasons. It is to give good shape and proper fit to the garment and also to allow freedom of movement and comfort to the wearer and to make the garment look attractive. There are different methods of introducing this fullness. They are darts, tucks, plates and gathers and such other devices. Coming to the darts, darts are used to shape a flat piece of fabric to fit the curves of a figure. Darts are generally made on the wrong side. Their size and position depends upon the type of shaping and fullness required. It disposes fullness by withholding width or length yet giving a smooth appearance to the garment. It is made by stitching a line that tapers to a point along a fold and gives a shape to the body bulge wherever it ends. It always points towards the fullest part of the body. Width of the dart influences the extent of shaping. Wider dots provide more shaping and narrower dots less shaping. The dots are generally functional and sometimes may be decorative too. Functional dots are those that are necessary for fitting the body curves at bust, hip, shoulder and elbow. Examples of functional darts are back waist darts, front underarm darts, under bust, front and back darts in a close fitting skirt etc. Decorative darts may serve this functional purpose as well as add significance to the design. While making a dart, the length of the dart and the width of the dart should be considered. And let us see what are the types of darts present. So the most common dart is the single dart and this standard dart is a triangular one in shape and wide at one end and pointed at the other. It is used at the bust, the back shoulder, skirt waist, pants back and at elbows. It should be machined from the wide end to the narrow end. tapering off to nothing at the point. The threads should be fastened at the tapered ends with a knot or it may be reinforced. Then there we have another variety that is called double pointed darts. These darts are wide in the middle and pointed at both the ends. It should be stitched in two steps that is start from the middle where the dart is by dust and stitch to the end and then go back to the middle and stitch to the other end. Dart should be pressed after stitching. This dart is generally used on one piece dress or close fitted shirts, blouses and jackets. The general rule is to press vertical dots towards center front or center back and horizontal dots downwards. For heavy fabrics, Cut along the fold of darts to within one inch of the point and press them open. Coming to the decorative dots, a dot may be sometimes stitched only part way and the unstitched part then looks somewhat like a tuck. Such darts are called as dart tucks. Any dart placed in an unusual manner or stitched on the right side of the garment can be said to be decorative. Usually these dots are very small. The other device to produce fullness is the tuck. It is a fold of fabric stitched in place by a running stitch or machine stitch on the right side of the garment as a means of shaping the garment to the body and also for holding the fullness or adds decorative effect at shoulders, waistlines, yokes, pockets or cuff of the sleeves etc. 
The tucks that are partly stitched help in shaping the garments. These are also used in children's garments to hold the elements for growth. Tucks add body to thin fabrics and textural interest to plain fabrics. Tucks can be used in groups or clusters and in graduated width. When calculating the amount of material that is needed, each tuck calls for an elements equal to twice its finish width. So, for making a group of four tucks of 1 by 8 inch finish width, allow 4 into 1 by 8 that is doubled that comes to 1 inch extra material. To stitch each tuck, fold along middle so that stitching lines coincide. Then stitch along the markings. Cut the garment section only after completing the stitching of the tucks in case of tucks appearing on curved edges such as armholes, necklines or yoke lines. Use of correct needles, matching threads and stitch density for making tucks are important as the quality of the tucks depends on these factors. There are several methods of uh, tacking. One is the pin tucks. These are tiny dainty tucks used on baby's clothes and fine blouses. They are very narrow tucks having the width of a pin head, hence the name. These are made generally less than 1 8 inch wide and the space may be around 0.5 centimeters. Lace may be inserted between the groups of tucks. Then the second variety is a wide tuck and these are mainly used for holding the fullness in place. They are also used for decoration in garments especially evening wear. The width of the tuck may vary from 0.5 centimeter to 2.5 centimeters as per the location of the garment. Piped or corded uh, tucks is another variety. These are made by placing cording on the wrong side of the fabric at center of the tuck fold as though it is enclosed before stitching the tuck. Stitching should be done close to the cording, taking care not to pick up the cord into the stitch. Another good looking tucks that are found on the fabrics or shell or scallop tucks. The finished tucks resemble a shell or scallop edge and hence the name. These are made purely for decorative purpose, especially on baby's dresses. The shell pattern like uh, faint dots can be placed on a folded uh, tuck and the tucks are stitched using small running stitches. At the dot point, two overcast stitches through the dot are made and pulled tight to hold the shell and the needle is made to run into the next dot. Generally, soft fabrics are suitable for making shell tucks. Then coming to the another variety of tucks that we see in the garments is you no know, cross tucks. Now, when rows of tucks are stitched along the fabric in both horizontal and vertical directions, the decoration is called as cross tucking. First, make the horizontal tucks by spreading them in desired width and also spacing them and uh, press them to one side. Then stitch the vertical tucks. Generally, this decoration is made in yoke or in a blouse with a tiny pin tucks to provide delicacy. Then another type of uh, providing fullness is the introducing the pleats. Garment drape beautifully when pleats are introduced into the garment. 
Pleats are folds of fabric that provide fullness in some parts of a garment. They can be placed single or in a series and can be pressed flat or left unpressed according to the style of the garment. Pressed pleats give a smooth slimming line to a garment whereas unpressed pleats provide a softer and fuller shape. Pleats are introduced generally at the waistline of skirts and dresses to provide fullness evenly all around. The preparation of pleats is similar to that of tucks, the main difference being that the pleats are seldom stitched all the way down. Sometimes they are stitched part way down the garment for flatness. Each pleat requires extra material or twice the width of the finished pleat. If pleats are to touch each other or overlap little all round the garment, then three times the finished width of the pleat may be required. And then coming to the types of pleats, one very common pleat seen is the knife or the side pleat. These are generally found in skirts especially to provide fullness at the bottom of the garment. They are generally about half inch to one inch wide and are turned towards the same direction. The direction may be reversed at center back or center front of the garment. To make knife pleats, fold the top fold line and bring the fold line to the placement line. The pleats may be tacked or pinned along the folded edge and then tacked on top of the pleat before stitching on the machine. Pleats can be top stitched in place from waist to hip to produce the slender effect. Another variety is the box pleat variety. Two knife pleats turned away from each other, that is one to the left and one to the right, form a box pleat. To make a box pleat, the fabric is made into two equal folds and turning them away from each other so that the folds meet at the back. These are used quite often for uniforms and sometimes one or two box pleats are made in the center front or center back to vary the design. And then we have another variety that is called the inverted pleat. It is nothing but it is just an opposite of the box pleat. It is made up of two knife pleats turned towards each other so that the folds meet in the middle on the right side of the garment. It is usually designed at center front or center back and looks like two knife pleats facing away from each other on the underside. To make an inverted box pleat, take two pleats of equal depth with the right sides together, pin along the pleat line. To make the pleat firm, tack along the pleat line from the lower edge, then stitch along the seam line and press them open. When both box and inverted box pleats are made in a row, they look alike as they are the two sides of the pleat series. And one more variety of pleat is the kick pleat. It is an opening in a seam backed by a fabric fold or extensions from the seam elements that form a pleat backing. If it is without a pleat backing, it is called a vent. This is actually a knife or inverted pleat which has the fullness released in the lower 6 to 8 inches of the skirt. When a skirt draft lacks fullness, which is actually required, it is easy to provide fullness by the use of a kick pleat without altering the pattern. 
These plates allow for movement in a straight skirt and is inserted at the base of center back seam side of the panel seams. To make a kick plate, stitch plain seam and place the underlay to each side of the seam elements and across the top of the plate. And another beautiful way of providing fullness is the gathers and the shirts. It is a very effective and decorative way of distributing fullness over a given area. Gathers are graceful folds of fabric that provide fullness suggesting a soft look which can be made using machine or hand stitches. These are formed by drawing the fabric together on a line of stitching and may be used to control the fullness at round waist, yoke lines, waist lines, neck lines and upper and lower edges of the sleeves. The amount of fabric required may be 2 to 2 and half times more than the gathered width of the garment. Gathering is done in different uh, ways. One is gathering by hand that it can be made by stitching two rows of running stitches of 0.25 cm length close together. And using the machine that it is a much faster process of uh, making gathers as compared to hand method and requires less skill. To make gathers using machine, mark seam line on the right side with the fabric by adjusting the machine for long stitch and uh, loosening the upper tension slightly. Make two rows of small stitches on either side of the seam line on the area to be gathered leaving longer thread to facilitate pulling of the fabric to become gathers. As upper tension is made loose, the bobbin thread can easily be pulled making the fabric to gather. The length of the stretch depends on the fabric type and the firm and closely woven fabrics require longer stitches. And then another method is by gathering by using elastic. So gathers can be made by narrow strip of elastic and stitching on the part of the garment which is to be gathered. And then we have another method of uh, uh, bringing in decoration in the garments is by shirring or by gauging. And shirring is a method of altering the fabric texture by making several rows of gathers. That is, we can have three or more rows of gathers here. And the rows should be evenly spaced. Shirring appears as a decorative feature at the shoulder, at the waistline and at the lower edge of the sleeve and generally at the narrower part of the garment also showing, allowing a certain degree of uh, stretching. The entire section of the garment may also be shirred for decorative effects such as yoke and a pocket. And shirring can be done by different methods. One is thread shirring. These are made by similar procedure of making gathers, but uh, we have more number of rows here. And uh, here after making uh, more number of uh, rows of gathers, pull the bobbin thread of all the rows and distribute the fullness evenly to the exact size that is required. The upper uh, and uh, bobbin thread should be knotted at the back after pulling. And then we have uh, elasticized shirts. As the name indicates, elastic uh, is used for pulling the threads to form the gathers. To make gathers using elastic, use an elastic fabric of 0.5 cm wide and the length equal to 3 fourth length of the ready width of the shirt fabric. To make uniform shirts, the fabric and the elastic strip should be divided into equal parts. Increase the stitch length, stretch the elastic evenly between the marking points and stitch in the center of the elastic. Elastic threads can also be made instead of elastic strip. The serviceability of the shirring depends upon the firmness of the elastic used. So far uh, we are uh, seeing how uh, you know gathers can be made, but now we see how this, uh, these gathers can be enriched. Smocking is a type of fabric enrichment consisting of tiny embroidery stitches sewed over the folds of gathers at regularly spaced intervals on the right side of the fabric. It is used to hold fullness or to add texture 
and surface interest to a bodice or a yoke, neckline or sleeves of children's or women's dress. Soft and uh, flat faced fabrics such as voiles, cambric and crepes are highly suitable for smoking. A medium weight and firmly twisted thread of cotton or silk is used for smoking. And first of all to do the smoking we have to gather the fabric. It is simple to produce smoking when correct procedure is being followed. Marking with a series of dots on the wrong side is required for smoking on a plain material. These dots should be evenly spaced around 0.3 centimeters apart and the distance between the rows may be around 0.5 to 1 centimeter. For heavy fabrics, the distance can be more and fabrics with the checks, plates or dots do not require the transfer of the pattern because they have already having the pattern. Using strong thread, pick up the dots along the rows and make several running stitches along. Complete all the rows, then the number of rows depends on the area to be covered. The width of the fabric should be three times as long as the gathered fabric for a smoking area. Draw up the fabric on the threads and fasten the thread ends by binding them together around the pins placed at one end of the fabric to hold them securely. And let us see what are the stitches used for smoking. Good quality embroidery threads of suitable color are used for smoking. All the stitches are worked from left to right. And the first uh, stitch we can see very commonly is the outline stitch. This is like a stem stitch used to make outlines. Work each row over the tubular fabric folds and then take out needle on the first fold on the extreme left by making small back stitch over the fold. While making the stitch, always keep the thread under the needle. Draw up each fold firmly after each stitch. And the second type of stitch which is seen is, all, is cable stitch or herringbone stitch. It is a variation of outline stitch done in two close rows. Start in the same way as for the outline stitch. While taking stitch, keep the thread above the needle for the first stitch and below the needle for the second and repeat throughout the length of the row. And another type of stitch used for smoking is the wave stitch. And to make wavy stitch effect, make odd number that is around 5, 7, 9 rows of uh, outline stitches diagonally upward and then downward. For the upward row, keep the thread below the needle and for the downward row, keep the thread above the needle. Repeat the process to make rows of diamond shapes or rows of wavy designs. And then we have uh, another uh, stitch called chevron and this type of uh, stitch uh, is a zigzag stitch and it is done over the folds of the fabric. Take a stitch on the first pleat at the left of a row of gathering stitches, pass the needle down to the next row of gatherings and take another stitch in the same first fold. Then over the same fold, take a stitch on the second fold, inserting the needle to the right. Bring it down between the first and second pleat. Keeping the thread below the needle, draw the stitch up so that the two pleats are held together closer. Then pass the needle up to the first row, take a stitch over the second plate with the thread above the needle, take a stitch over the third plate, bringing the needle out between the second and the third plate and draw the stitch tight. Make the second row of zigzag stitches in such a way that its points meet the points of the second row followed by the fold on the third row to form a diamond. Another decorative method of smoking is the honeycomb smoking. This type of smoking resembles the honeycomb, hence the name is given. To start with, bring the needle out in the first pleat, 
take two tiny back stitches over the fold to secure the thread. Pull the needle through the first fold about 0.5 cm below the first stitch, keeping the thread above the needle. With thread below the needle, put the needle through the second fold at the same level. Draw the thread tightly together. Put the needle through the same fold at the same level as the first stitch. With the thread above the needle, put the needle through the third fold at the same level and draw uh, tightly together all these rows. Repeat till the end of the row. French smocking is another method of holding the fullness widthwise and also lengthwise. In this type of smocking, the stitches are not seen on the right side of the fabric, but it assumes a desired shape. Twice the length and width of the fabric is required to produce this type of smocking. And a dotted pattern on the wrong side is required to draw the corners of a square together to produce a desired shape on the right side of the fabric. Then let us see other methods of uh, providing the fullness and one which is very significant among them is the flare. And flares are introduced usually into skirts and sleeves for adding fullness and decoration. Flare in a basic skirt is the difference between its measurements at the hemline and the hip line. Circular skirts that are made from a complete circle of a fabric have the maximum flare. To introduce flare into a basic paper pattern for a skirt, make slashes starting from the hemline and stopping just up to the waistline. The slashes should be regularly spaced around the hem. Spread out each slash and pin both edges to another sheet of paper placed underneath. The space spread between the two slashed pieces will decide the amount of flare present. Flare is introduced into garments, you know, with the use of gaudets, gores or making circular patterns. Then we see generally the frills and ruffles in the dresses. It is a strip of fabric, lace or ribbon, tightly gathered or pleated on one edge and applied to a garment, bedding or other textiles as a form of trimming. These are used for the purpose of adding decoration to a garment. Sometimes they are used at the hems of skirts and dresses to add length. Ruffles may be found at the sleeve edges, necklines and armholes and such other type of uh, uh, places in a garment. To make frills, allow at least one and a half times the length of the piece to which the frill will be attached. The width of the frill is generally anything from 1 inch to 3 inches. The longer side should be cut along the lengthwise grain of the material for proper drape. The gathered edge of the frill can be concealed in a seam or a facing or binding or a wide band. Then another way of producing again the flare in the uh, garments is the use of gaudets. These are wedge shaped extra panel of fabric which are set into the skirt so that the wide side of the wedge becomes a part of the hem of the skirt. Flouncy springy patterns often use gaudets which also allow more freedom of movement on the part of the wearer. Any type of fabric can be used in a gaudet skirt although some fabrics may be good and perform better than others. The gaudet may be set into a seam of the skirt or the skirt may be slashed so that the slashed edges form the seams to join the gaudet to the skirt. A gaudet is inserted in the bottom of a skirt starting at least halfway down the skirt and sometimes further also. This facilitates snug fitting of the skirt at hip level and provide flare when it reaches knees and finally the bottom of the hemline. Generally, multiple gaudets are inserted into a skirt 
at set intervals. The distribution of the gaudets throughout the skirt gives the skirt a rippling effect. A single large gaudet may be used in the back of the skirt to make it more comfortable to walk in. The gaudets can be made from the same materials as the skirt or sometimes they can be sewn in contrasting colors, fabrics or having a, you know, any other embroidered material for a distinctive look. Lightweight fabrics are generally used for making gaudets, otherwise the skirts become heavy. So, so far we have seen how fullness can be introduced in the garments. You know, because we always wear different types of uh, garments and uh, we generally look for the garments which are becoming to our figure. So, when large, uh, you know, variety of uh, these garments are available in the market and choosing the one uh, which is becoming to us will be maybe little difficult. In that case, you know, we can choose the fabrics or garments which are having the fullness so that we can uh, uh, wear it without any problem because our figure is not going to look uh, or given that much importance uh, in the silhouette. And so, always fullness, sometimes camouflage the figure irregularities and also enhance the uh, figure.